blessings of the Sabbath to everyone. Amen. I am always honored and blessed to be able to come home. Amen. This is a place that I cherish, fond memories, love dearly, and feel always welcomed. Amen. You have become family. And it's good to see each one of you. And I am honored to be here. I want to thank your pastor and the elders and the officers for the privilege of sharing the pulpit today. And I said to him, you're not going to stream the service? And so I, I'm, I'm blessed. And I, I don't like to talk about me but this is a special experience for me. I've just gone through a major sickness, not COVID, but I had stage four cancer. And back in March or February, I didn't think I was gonna make it. And, but the Bam of Gilead is in my life. And I have a friend that prayed with me daily, morning, noon, and night, spent countless hours making sure that my spirit was never broken, even though the pain was intense. And uh, I love her dearly, and I thank her for her support and her encouragement that has allowed me to be able to be here today, because in those moments in the crucible, you need to know that God is with you and, and you can't get off the bed that there's somebody there who can lift you and she knows who I'm talking about she's not here she's far away but the distance did not separate us and I'm grateful and so this is the first preaching engagement I've accepted since I was diagnosed back in January. And it's by the grace of God that I'm here today. Amen. Turn your eyes up on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Would you sing that for me, please? Turn your eyes up on Jesus. Eternal Father, we've come from varied experiences, but united through your blood, called by your spirit to give honor and glory to you, desiring to give greater honor and glory to you. And so we pray that you would speak to us so that we may grow in grace the transformation which you've begun, you would continue until the day Jesus Christ shall come and we'll be able to hear, well done, come ye blessed, inherit. So speak to us, O God, through the volume of your book and convict us of truth and then enable us to do truth so that we may become instruments of light to others who are groping in darkness, that your name may be glorified on all the earth. So, Lord, make me as a nail upon the wall, and let that wall be your hand. And from a thing so common 
and ask so small. Please paint a beautiful picture of your face so that we may behold thee and in beholding thee be changed into the likeness of your image. In Jesus' name. The founding of a nation. Interestingly enough, when the pastor called and asked me if I could preach today, and I pondered and prayed, and the Lord impressed upon me this message and this title, I was not it was not in my consciousness that this was July 4 weekend. But in talking with my friend, she said to me, you know, it's July 4 weekend. And I said, you know, you just confirmed the message for me. I don't discuss my sermons because Alan White says the devil cannot read your heart, but he can hear your words. And so you never discuss the message. But God sends confirmation. And we've come on this Sabbath, on this Sabbath of a weekend, that the whole nation turns to its independence, its founding. And many of us have left distant shores Fair Isles, Blue Waters, caring communities to come in search of a dream, to be part of an American dream for economic prosperity primarily, educational opportunity, and to see how we could, what we figure would improve our lot in life. But we've come to a nation that was not designed for us. And I believe that the book of Revelation is present truth. It's not only what will happen in years to come. It is what's happening now that informs us of what will happen in years to come. Because God does nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And we know that because we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation, we have a prophetic experience. Not only do we have a prophet among us, but each one of us is called to a prophetic ministry because each of us who confess Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior is called to be a teller of truth Amen. and to warn the world of what God intends to do and confirm it based on what he's done. And so the book of Revelation written by John speaks to our experience. And my friends, the book, some 404 verses, of which 265 of them allude to 550 Old Testament references, 53 of which come from the book of Daniel. If we were to extract the Old Testament allusions from the book of Dan a Revelation, the book falls apart. It doesn't make sense. There's no cohesion or coherence to the book. And if you took the references of Daniel out of the book, there is no way to systematically make the book fit into our experience. So the understanding of Revelation 
begins in Daniel. In Revelation, my friends, we can interpret it, some people, as parallel. Things happen on parallel tracks. Some interpret it consecutively, one after the other. But as a Seventh-day Adventist, we interpret the book telescopically. That one series of events, the seven seals, the seventh seal begins the seventh trumpets, which begin the seven plagues. And that the seven churches are the view of the shepherd. The seven seals are the view of the sheep. And so you look at that in the integrated concept of the book, which tells us that the book informs us. Because it was written to encourage. And to encourage us, my friends, not only of what will yet happen, but to encourage us of what we are going through now, that we can be confident that God is going to win. For when John received this book, it says the revelation of Jesus. The Father gave it to Jesus, who gave it to the Spirit, who gave it to the angel to give John. It's not the revelation of John, it's the revelation of Jesus. And the central motif in this book is the Lamb. It has beasts, it has all kind of imagery. But the point of the book is that the lamb of the tribe of Judah, the land of Judah, whose blood was slain, is triumphant. And because the lamb is triumphant, we too shall be triumphant. Did not promise that there will not be oppression and hardship but that we shall overcome. For John was in a dismal, desperate, and dark place. He was on a place, my friends, where the sky was his roof, and the rocks were his pillars, and the vegetation was his food, and he was exposed to the elements and to the insects. He was banished on the Isle of Patmos. He was in isolation. He was without companionship. But he wasn't murmuring and complaining. Because to murmur and to complain is to chastise God. Yes. It's to question the providence of God. It's to say, God, if you really love me, you would not allow this to happen to me. But John understood something that Ellen White says in Councils on Stewardship, that God's providence knows no haste and no delay. But that if we could see the end from the beginning, Christ's object lesson. We would not wish to be led anywhere than the way in which he's led us. And because John's confidence was in God, the circumstances of life did not dictate his attitude about life. Amen. For my friends, we learn to live by conviction. We learn to live by the fact that we belong to a God who is mindful of our experience. And who often allows us, but who has an unexpected end of goodness for us. Because he knew us when we were yet in our mother's womb. And therefore John is praising God in the midst of hardship and deprivation. And I often wondered, what is our attitude in difficulty? What is our attitude in trial? And my friends, I'm convinced that we must go through trial and tribulation. Paul says in the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he's given us a ministry of suffering so that we may have a ministry of consolation to others who suffer. For if we never suffered, we do not know how to minister to others. And the book of Revelation assures us that no matter what the hardship or the suffering is in life, that God will win. And because John is in the spirit on the Lord's day, praising God, God gives him the revelation. You see, my friends, the revelation from God is often hindered by our attitude about the circumstances of our lives. 
because it means that we've looked away from God to circumstances. But as the Sabbath school lesson tells us this week, the good shepherd not only leads us to green pastures and still waters, he takes us through valleys and sometimes allows the enemies to come, but he's leading us home. And no matter what path they, or what experiences we have, if our confidence is in God, we too shall win because God has already won. And John, praising God, receives this wonderful message to give to us so that those of us living in 2022 can understand how to cope today. Now, if we look at the book of Revelation purely through a Eurocentric traditional theology, we will think of things yet to come. And I'm not so interested in the 666. And we know the interpretation of 666, and I believe it can be applied and it's correct. But we miss a lot of truth in this text that is relevant to our experience as an African-American people in this land that was founded to which we have come in pursuit of a dream. For my friends, the American dream was not founded for us. We came to pursue a dream. But we came to pursue a dream that was not dreamt for us. And therefore, we have suffered. And we have no other source of help or strength but God. And I believe, my friends, that when you look at Revelation through an Afrocentric perspective, through the lens of a liberation, rather than merely through a traditional theology that pontificates about something that is going to happen somewhere in the future, that you can apply this book to our present experience and find hope. For the book was written to encourage because all of God's word is designed to encourage in the present. He's a very present help in time of trouble. So if we continue to interpret the book at both something, some point in time that will happen, yes, we are not experiencing the mark of the beast now. Sunday law has not been passed. But we are being treated just like they will treat us. Are you with me? And so, we should find encouragement in this book. Because it was a book that was written not only to encourage, but to remind us that Jesus Christ is the focal point of the book. Amen. It's a book about ecclesiology, talks about the seven churches. Yes. It's a book, my friends, about eschatology. It talks about last events and beasts and all kinds of strange animals. It's a book, my friends, that talks about things yet to come. Yes. It even talks about salvation, yes. serotology. But it's a book about Christology that we shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The middle verse of this book is probably chapter 12, verse 10, by the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And too many of us often miss the Lamb because we are cut up in images and argue about a lot of stuff that even though true does not give us strength because our strength comes from God. 
It also reminds us that all prophecy will come to a culmination at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That when Jesus Christ comes the second time, it will be the fulfillment of all biblical prophecy. Yeah. And the revelation, therefore, indicates to us that it is the last word on the fulfillment of prophecy. It also tells us, my friends, that there's moral and doctrinal issues which we must address. And so you can't just believe what you want to believe. You got to believe what God wants you to believe. God has a standard. And the church in the last days is challenged. We live in a land of cultural wars. And many of you are caught up on one side or the other of the cultural war based upon what you determine your political persuasion to be. But as a child of God, we cannot afford to affiliate politically. Because the reality is that there's very little difference between the Democratic and Republican Party. They all make promises and don't fulfill any of them to us. My friends, we need to be a people of conviction. And the choices that we make when we exercise our civic authority must be based not on party affiliation, but must be based on principle and conviction. You see, all worldview must be grounded in biblical worldview. What is the Bible saying to us about these circumstances? For if we don't have a biblical worldview, we get caught up then in the isms of the day. And we are like a reed blown in the wind. And we get disappointed because the politicians don't do what they're supposed to do. You see, there are two forms of governance that are, that, that are exercised in this country. This republic is governed by one or two ways, depending on which party holds power. When the progressive, liberal parties, democratic parties are in power, they run the country by a polis orientation. You do the greatest good for the greatest number of people all the time. When the Republican Party is in power, they run the country by what is called rational theory choice. That government has limited resources, and limited resources means that you cannot take care of everybody, so you only can take care of some, and some people will suffer. And therefore, inflation and recession are not automatically cyclical. Recessions and inflation are made by political decisions based upon one of the concepts of governance that we see around us. That's important to us to remember because we know that based upon great controversy, that the conflict that we will enter into the last days that will usher in Jacob's time of trouble will be economic. Hello? Do you all read? You got to read. You got to read the great controversy. And so when you look at CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and listen to NPR, you're not listening to news. You're hearing signs. You got to see this as signs. What's going on in Ukraine and what's going on with the, the, the inflation and what's happening with the, the, the shortages, uh, the, the lack of goods and services? My friends, these are signs of the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But if you don't have a biblical worldview, you see it as news. And then you wish, well, wish we had another party in power, wish we had a different president. It doesn't matter who occupies the seat. Because we are marching, we are living our lives in the context of the great controversy. And God has already told us what to expect and what will happen. But he also tells us that we will win because he's won. But we have to apply 
his word to our lives today. Amen. And the prophecy was written to root out paganism. Things that are contrary to God's will. Now there are a couple of ways you can interpret the book. You can see the book in its preterist view. Are you with me? Yes. It happened in the past. It belongs in the past. You can see the book in its futurist view. It's yet to come. You can see the book merely as an allegory, not real. Or you can see the book in its historical view, which is the method of interpretation used by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the historical view of Revelation tells us that the world is moving from point to point. It's not just going to keep going around and around and around. But Eden lost will be Eden restored. And between Eden lost and Eden restored, these are the events that will occur. Matthew 24, 25. Matthew 24, the events in the world. Matthew 25, the events in the church. Daniel 2, 7, 9, and 11. And Revelation pulls all this together as a fulfillment of Matthew 24, 25, Daniel 2, 7, 9, and 11 to tell us that this is the reality of our lives today. Amen. And so when we look at this book and we get to Revelation 13, the founding of a nation, the Bible says, and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And we read that and we run to the last verse. And no man shall be able to buy or sell at least he have the mark of the name of the number. But there's a whole lot of truth between verse 11 and verse 18 that tells us about the present reality of our lives. You see, my friends, when the founding fathers left the European shores and sailed across the treacherous ocean in search of a new land, are you with me? Yes. They were running from two things. Notice that this beast came up out of the earth, but it had two horns like a lamb, which gives the impression of peace and gentleness, and compassion, and care, and, 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 and something to cuddle, and fuzziness. But it says it spake like a dragon, which tells you that this beast may be a chameleon. This beast can't be trusted. This beast is two-fisted. It appears, but it speaks. And if we believe that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, then we need to look more at what the beast says than how the beast appears. It appears like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. And I want to submit to you this morning that in terms of our experience as black people in this country, this lamb like this beast that appeared like a lamb has never been a lamb to us. It's always speak like like a dragon to us. Are you with me? Yes. Am I talking true? Yes. Because when the forefathers, the founding fathers, our forefathers of Africa, when the founding fathers left the European shore and sailed the treacherous ocean in search of freedom, they were running from two things. They were running one from religious oppression and they were living, running, my friends, from political persecution. They were running from unfair taxation, and they were running, my friends, from religious persecution, and they wanted to find some place where they could bring their families up in freedom, where the individual autonomy, the individual sovereignty of choice with which they were created, they believed that God created them with a free will, and therefore, they were not going to subject themselves to oppression or persecution because it violated their free will. Hello? 
and so as to affirm their free will, they had to find some place that they could make sure it was protected. But not only to affirm their free will, but to make sure that there was, they, they, they respected each other as equal. And so, the, you know, it says it had two horns. Yes. This lamb had two horns. This nation was founded on two great ethical principles. The principle of individual autonomy or sovereignty, freedom of choice, and the principle of equality that all people have inalienable rights which should not be violated and are entitled to life, liberty, and what? Justice. That's the lofty, lofty idea of what Reagan called a shining on a hill. And this document that was formed the Constitution that is heralded as this great document, a sacrosanct to this nation. However, did not include us. Revelation 13 says, this beast like a lamb with two horns. Equality, autonomy but speak like a dragon. And I'm suggesting to you that equality was not given to us. And autonomy was not given to us. But we experienced the wrath of the lamb, of the dragon. For my friends, in 1619, when they discovered that they could not deal with the harshness of the terrain and the difficulty of the climate. They found a people in a land called Africa and enslaved us. For their economic and familial benefits. And so we are here, not because we are part of the dream. We are here because we were needed to help them fulfill the dream. And those of us who lived in lands afar off have come in search of that dream. And the dream is an elusive dream because the dream was never intended for us. You and I cannot afford to make the American dream the focal point of our lives. We must come to the realization that no matter how well we do, no matter how much we accomplish, no matter what we achieve or attain, this dream was not for us. We were here merely to be servants and slaves. We were here, brought here as useful people to help those who could not deal with the harshness of the terrain. And the sad reality is that even after emancipation, some of us are still mentally enslaved. Because we allow a Eurocentric thinking to dictate how we see ourselves. And we look outside of ourselves for validation because we don't know our own history. And if you want to keep a people in ignorance, if you want to keep a people feeling inferior, you take away three things that the Jews never lost, that the Arabs maintain. You take away their religion, their language, and the history. You must have a common language, and we don't have one. 
And so because I was born in Barbados, and you were born in Guyana or Jamaica, I think something is wrong with you because you speak different than I do. And because you were born in Mississippi, you think something's wrong with the Jamaicans because they speak different than you do. And we don't like each other. Because we judge each people by externals. And we don't see the fact that we are brought together by the, the lamb, by the blood. It's the blood of the lamb that's brought us together. We must have a biblical view of the world. And we allow externalities and incidents to divide us. But the Eurocentric thinking still see us as less than. Even though some of us may break through and get a little something, something, something. My friends, none of us are free as long as all of us are not free. None of us have achieved when some of us are still not achieving. And too many of us have adopted the mentality of survival of the fittest. In the, that mentality, I have to get you before you get me. Because if I don't get you, I will not get. And therefore, I have to get rid of you so that I may get. And that sense of the, old, the New Testament says they had all things in common. We've lost. Because in the survival of the fittest, it is a competitive model of life that we've adopted rather than a Christian model of life where our weaknesses are supported by each other's strengths and we bear each other's burdens. So in this land where we were brought in 1616, we are still struggling to be Are you with me? Yes. You see, my friends, there's an uproar going on in the country about Roe versus Wade. And I'm not going to make a judgment on that. I'll tell you what the church teaches. The church teaches that abortions are acceptable when the mother's life is threatened. And there could be a lot of reasons why the mother's life may be threatened. All kind of health issues can exist. Yeah. Abortions are okay in instances of rape because it was not it was a violent act. She had no choice, or it is instance of incest. Her trust was violated. Yeah. That's what the church teaches, and that's the seventh day disposition on abortion. Okay, so you you you, you get caught up in a Catholic theology where it says there should be no abortions, period, for any reason at all. Or you get caught up, my friend, in a secular activity, where it says that you should be able to have abortion on demand up to the day of birth, because you decided that you don't want the child, which runs into infanticide. But this church teaches that there are acceptable reasons when a pregnancy may be terminated. And those reasons do not violate the sanctity of life because they affirm a more viable life. See, the issue of viability is the issue. And the mother's life is always more viable than the life of the fetus, the fetus or the embryo. And so you move to the more viable life. Are you with me? Yes. And you can find that in, go on Adventist.org and look up abortion and see what the church teaches. You need to know what your church teaches so you can decide what you believe and not based on what the Republicans say or the Democrats say or whatever. You know what the Bible says. Because something is legal does not mean it's moral. And so you need to have a moral view of the sanctity of life and don't get caught up in legal arguments about life. And so my friends, here we are. This lamb with two horns. Equality, autonomy but did not have the heart to give it to us.
because the heart of this lamb is a dragon. And we like to talk about the first beast and the Catholics and the this and that. And that's true. And I'm not saying that's not true. I'm saying that as a people, we need to see a reality in this text that speaks to our experience beyond, my friends, the mere traditional interpretation of the prophet. How does this text speak to our experience? It's not just about an institution. What an institution will do is about what happens to me as an individual, that I'm living in a land with a lamb-like beast that wants equality and autonomy for its own, but treats me like a dragon. And so you find, my friends, that the Supreme Court in 1857 in the case of Greg Scott, Greg Scott versus Jeff Sandford, rule that black people or people of African descent were not entitled, were not entitled, are you with me? Were not entitled to any kind of rights, could not be citizens in this land. You talk about precedent, and the court can't reverse precedent. But in 1857, the Supreme Court, Justice Tenney wrote the decision that we were not entitled to any kind of privilege of citizenship and its rights because we were born with the wrong color of skin. The sad thing is that we didn't come looking for them. They came and brought us. Right. Okay. We were in a land where we had rights. Yes. Yes. And they brought us to a land to take away our rights. Yes. And that decision of 1857 led to the Civil War. And then the Emancipation Proclamation. But even though the Proclamation Emancipation was signed in 1863. It did not root out the evil of the heart. Because there's something you can't legislate. You can legislate actions. You can't legislate attitudes. And so in 1863, the Act of Emancipation was signed. But we still were not given our full rights. And so in the Dred Scott case, my friends, you had then Reconstruction. And it was during the Reconstruction era that the 13th Amendment, which outlaws slavery, was passed. And then you had the 14th Amendment, Sections 1 and 2, which outlawed, my friends, it gave us the right of equality, and it gave us the fact that we were no longer three-fifths of a person. You see, the people who left the European shores and came here, running from persecution, is a funny thing about human beings. When the persecutor finds freedom, the persecutor finds someone else to persecute. And running from political persecution and religious oppression the dragon's heart then found a people to persecute and to oppress. And it took my friends from 1690 to 1865-68 for these amendments to be put in the Constitution. This document that was written in the 1700s, 1781, these, the document as it was written in 1781 did not include us. As a matter, it said we were three-fifths of a person. And therefore, we could be enslaved. And we were only a commodity. We were only a useful tool. And when the woman got pregnant and the man acted up because he remembered his dignity in his former land, 
he would be taken out in front of her or she would be brought in front of him and her stomach would be slit and the embryo would be thrown around to exercise I have power over you what you go and, and you can imagine my friends the, the the emasculation of that man who sees his wife bearing his child and could do nothing about it or would see the massa come to the dwelling and take his wife to the great house are you with me? Yeah. This is the founding of a nation. Yeah. This is the independence that we celebrate this weekend. That you're going to barbecue, you're going to do this and that, and you're going to have... My friends, we need to understand there's a sad reality to all eyes in this land. And while we make it a time of, 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 of fun and, 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 and revelry and frivolity, there's a price that was paid and is being paid and we still haven't gotten there yet. Take her to the great house and did what he wanted and the man remained powerless. And black women, you need to be Understand the black man is coming from a long place of being castrated and the vestiges of slavery still linger in many of our men. In many of our men. Because the family system in which they grew up did not teach them that they were valuable. And so you can't put them on their knees because they're already on their knees. You need to help lift them up. Hello? And black men, you need to understand that the black woman is looking for you to be a king and a prince because she remember her former years where you were responsible and you provided and you had a sense of loyalty and integrity and that she was honored. You cannot treat her with indifference. And as that child is emptied underground, the process called milling, this man is dehumanized because he's only three fifths of a person. And that was written into the Constitution. And all the years passed. That's why the court in 1857 could say that people of African descent were not citizens or entitled to the privileged citizen because they're not human. And then, my friends, the, the next landmark case was Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. We again, the court ruled separate but equal. That whereas there's no emancipation and you have legal equality, you're not entitled to social equality. And therefore the Jim Crow laws came into existence. You turn off the television, pick up a book, read. Understand the context of our lives. Understand, my friends, where we are living, the land, not only the land in which we are living, but that we are living in a time that we need to be mindful when we see the social, the cultural issues going on and ask ourselves the question, what is the biblical worldview? And Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, and Jim Crow. And my friends, it was not until Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka in 1954 that we were given equality. From 1690 to 1954, before we were granted any kind of legal status of being equal. But whereas you can legislate out segregation activity, 
You can't legislate out discrimination, which is an attitude. And therefore, my friends, we live in a land where we are tolerated, but not yet accepted. And if we're going to find acceptance, we've got to find it among ourselves. And as members of the remnant church who come under the umbrella of the Lamb, the, love, the blood of God should make us accept each other because God is no respect of persons. And those of us who call ourselves Christian, who believe in the Lamb of God, cannot afford to have dragon hearts towards each other. For when we treat each other less than, we're behaving just like the founding fathers towards our own. And our own are, look, our own are looking to us because the rest of the world is saying you don't belong. If you're black, stand back. And our indifference and our attitudes of, of, of resentment. So you get the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery. You get the 14th Amendment, sections 1 and 2. Guaranteeing citizenship and, and, and removing the three-fifths status. And then you get the 15th Amendment, which gave us enfranchisement, the right to vote. And so we, these are not things that were given to us in the original document. So when you have Supreme Court justices who says that they're originalists or they're textualists, or they want to see what the founding fathers meant when they wrote the document. They're saying to us, you don't belong. Because if they go by the original document, the original document said we are three-fifths. The Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, which was just used in the Roe versus the Wade, says that what rights are not enumerated to the federal government belong to the states. And since it's not enumerated to the federal government, therefore the federal government does not have the right to, to, to make law because it's a state law. But my friends, when you give it back to the state and you don't have the economic viability to move from Alabama to New York, you're going to suffer. And therefore, there's a role for the federal government in maintaining if we're going to achieve equality, it must come through federal legislation. Because it's the arbiter. You see, Dred Scott was a slave of a man named Blow, who had a very unsuccessful farm in Alabama near Huntsville. And interestingly enough, is the land now where Oakwood University sits. Slave land. God is an interesting God. And here, this beast, this lamb, has spoken to us for 400 years like a dragon. I could go through Supreme Court case after Supreme Court case. Griswold versus Connecticut. Lovin versus Virginia. Barr versus Hardwick. And you see all these cases of contraception and marriage, contraception and unmarried, homosexuality. Moore versus East Cleveland, we have private occupancy. And all these are landmark cases. But they all were founded on a premise that is not expressed in the Constitution. They were founded on the premise of the right to privacy. The Constitution does not expressly or explicitly have a right to privacy. The Fourth Amendment that says people can't search your house is not a right to privacy. It's search and seizure. And so they must have a warrant. The first time that the right to privacy was argued as, a as implied in the Constitution 
was by Brandes and Warren, who wrote in the Harvard Law Review in 1892, that because of a principle called substantive due process, there's a right to privacy. There are two processes the court uses. Procedural due process, which is the Fourth Amendment. That the police can't just come in your house. They must have a warrant. If they're going to arrest you, they must read you your Miranda rights. That's procedural. Right to jury trial, Sixth Amendment, procedural. Substantive due process. You see, my friends, you need to turn off the television and read. Substantive due process says that the government cannot infringe upon your right to liberty, life, or property with unreasonable, capriciously, or arbitrarily without a compelling reason. That you must be given due notice and be able to mount a defense against the actions of the government when they want to take your life. And that's why people on death row can appeal your liberty or your property so that you have this thing called the right to privacy. The court argues that because there's no right to privacy expressly exp uh, expressed in the Constitution, therefore, and Ginsburg said this in 1992 in New York Times interview, that a lot of laws have been formed on tenuous legal grounds. All these cultural issues, termination, we call it abortion. The court calls it termination of pregnancy, homosexuality, contraception, were all formed on this principle of substantive due process and the right to privacy. But when you have a court that says it's originalist, it's textualist. It reads the Constitution and applies it as it's written. And they don't see those words there. Then the court overturns precedent because they says it's not a super precedent. Now, Brown versus Board of Education is a super precedent because equality is written in the Constitution. Are you with me? Yes. And so, where am I going? Let me take you there. When you look at what's going on in this country, this dream that we have come in pursuit of, you need to ask yourself the question, Lord, how can I best serve you and be ready to meet you when you shall come? Because this same court will take away your right to the free exercise of worship. You have an activist court. And therefore, the right that is guaranteed as a free exercise of conscience will be taken away for economic reasons. Ellen White in Great Controversy says that in the last days, there will be anarchy in the streets as the economy begins to fall apart. And when it begins to fall apart, they will take property, and they will even take your spouses, and they will eventually blame the people of God for the economic deprivation they're suffering and turn on us. Great controversy. The impending doom, the coming conflict. And I'm saying to you, my friends, when I apply Revelation 30 through the lens of Afrocentric liberation theology rather than Eurocentric theology that merely looks at 666, when I apply it to our day-to-day -day lives, I'm saying to you that we are living in the 20s of time. That we need to understand that the beast is already speaking to us. That we are already under the that the wrath of the dragon. Because not only are we Seventh-day Adventists, but we are black Seventh-day Adventists. And the Seventh-day Adventist church is a real interesting church. Love my church. 
Only church I want to belong to. But whereas the power of this church is in the hands of Eurocentric people, the membership of this church is growing through Afrocentric, Asian, Latin American people. If you took us out of this church, this church does grow. The growth of this church is in our community. And I believe that James Cone is right when he says God is always on the side of the oppressed. God is never with the oppressor. God is always the God of the oppressed. And we have been an oppressed people since 1619. Now, Israel spent 400 years in Egypt. And then 40 more years in the wilderness. To get to the promised land. My friends, you do the math. From 1619 to 2022, we are on the edge of eternity. Jesus Christ soon will come. That decree that will go forth will go forth very soon. The one we like to talk about, the 666. But the mark, the mark in the head and the forehead, the head represents the spiritual thinking, the hand represents authority. That if you and I do not get our lives centered in the Lamb, if Jesus Christ does not become the focal point of our lives, if the blood of the Lamb is not what guides us from day to day, we are going to be lost. If we remain caught up in pursuing the American dream, it was not a dream made for us. It's an elusive dream. We must be more interested in having our names remain in the Lamb's book of life. It must become our urgency. It must become, my friends, our commitment to spend time with the word of God, to spend time in prayer, to be careful in our witness so that the lamb, the blood of the lamb is our covering, that our lives are covered by the blood because, my friends, we are at the edge of eternity. Jesus Christ is soon to come. The dragon has been speaking to us since 1619, we don't have to wait for a law to be passed. And the wife says, slavery will return. And if you're honest, if you're honest, you know that even though you have accomplished much, you still don't get the recognition you deserve. You know that when your children leave home, you have to wonder which police officer they will encounter. When you send them away to school, you wonder how they're going to be treated. Because we are still seen in the eyes of many as less than. Our citizenship must therefore be in heaven. For even though we have legal status, we don't have social acceptance. But we serve a God who says, I am your God. I love you with an everlasting love. You see, God not only gives us covenantal love, he gives us acceptance in covenant. He says, you belong to me, I belong. Fear not, be not dismayed. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe in I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. That where I am, you may be also. All the deprivation and the hardship and the suffering that we've experienced in this land. Jesus Christ says, one day, I'm going to fix it for you. Amen. Ears have not heard, eyes have not seen. Night entered in the heart of man what I've prepared for you. How can you miss that? How can you miss that, my friends? It is time to make ourselves right with God. Look at your life and ask yourself the question, am I right with Jesus? What is my priority from day to day? What is my witness? Am I covered by the blood? Do I love Jesus more than these? 
having sailed from distant land in pursuit of a dream that is an elusive dream, it will be a sad thing to lose not only this dream, but to lose Jesus' dream also. And many of us know that we are not as fervent or as faithful to Jesus' dream as when we were in our other place. And so my question to you today is this. It says, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Are you covered by the blood? The sin that's going to take most of us to hell is a sin of busyness. Too busy for God. In pursuit of a dream that was never designed for us. Individual autonomy, God gave it to us. He made us with the freedom of choice. No man can take it. Equality, all men were created equal in the sight of God. How do we treat each other? It's time for the men and women of memory to treat each other with the dignity of heaven because we are one in Christ Jesus. I believe I'm talking to men and women today who want to say, Lord, I want to be washed anew. I want to make sure that my call and election is sure, that my worldview is biblical, and that my priority is Jesus. Raise your hands. Lord, not only I want to make sure my priority is Jesus, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to change, oh God, the things that have hindered me from making him my priority. Stand up. So, Lord, today, I want you to help me to get a new dream, a dream of a promised land that we are on the verge of. I want to make heaven my home. And I'm willing, Lord, to let you change me so that I may be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. When you've made that decision, come. Lord, I want you to change me so that I can make heaven my home. Come. Put all your masks and come. Houses and cars and education and jobs not going to do it for us. We're going to have to run and leave all those things. Only Jesus will. Every head is bowed, every is closed. There's a man, a woman, a boy, a girl who's come to this place today to answer this question Lord, I want to be baptized. I need somebody to study the Bible with me so that I may know more of Jesus and be able to be, hear from him, come ye blessed of my Father. It's your decision to receive Bible studies, to know more of this Jesus and be baptized one day. Would you raise your hand where you are? It says, Lord, God bless you. Is there someone else today who wants to say yes? I need somebody to study with me so that I may be baptized and go all the way with Jesus, where he shall come. I want to live by a biblical worldview. Somebody else has come here to make. This is the decision God sent you here today to make. Where's the elder of the church? Elder Price? 
come. This is the flock that God has entrusted to you in the absence of your pastor. Come, pray for the flock. Let us pray. Father, as we stand before heaven and earth today, we give you thanks for your abundant grace that you have extended to us from the day of our birth to this our very hour. We understand that we have been wayward, O Lord, but you've been merciful, you've been faithful, you've been kind. And we thank you who brought us to this moment where your children are now responding to your call. Father, we ask, Lord, that you will take them into your arms to embrace them, O Lord, to reassure them that grace is still available to them today. And as you have extended grace to them, Lord, I pray that by faith they'll lay hold of you, never to look to the left nor to the right, never to look from whence they have come, but to keep their eyes firmly upon you, Lord, knowing that you and you alone is able to save them to the utmost. So as you understand their mind and their hearts more perfect than either one of us can, we ask, O oh Father, that you will take them and that you bless them and that you'll set up edges of protection around about them and those who will care for them, O oh Lord, spiritual and otherwise. We thank you for your manservant who on your behalf has extended this call. We ask, Lord, that you bless him in a special way. You have brought him a mighty long way. And Lord, we know you have much further to take him. So may he continue to hold on to your un ever unchanging hands. May he put his faith fully and securely in you, Lord, because you've never failed him before. And I know, Lord, you'll never fail him at all. So we thank you for this hour that you have presented us. We thank you for the opportunity to call upon your name one more time. We thank you for the Sabbath day you've blessed us with, O oh Lord. And as we give you the praise and the glory and the honor, we ask, O oh Father, that you'll do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and that is to save us into your heavenly kingdom. This is our humble prayer we ask in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.